right. Hello, Dallas. Okay, we're so like asleep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I can't hear myself, but maybe that's because I need to get over here. Okay, yeah. That's good. I'm going to try to use this as much as I can um, because of A, video, and B, I have voice nodules. So pardon me if my voice is a little scratchy. If you can't hear, just raise your hand or yell out, hey, Terry, talk louder. I can do that. Um, so I am Terry Noto. I am from Tangerine Mountain Imports and Designs. Um, we have a booth in the vendor room. We sell kimono. We are the largest kimono importer in the United States. Um, we've been in business now for five years, um, and it's really been thanks to folks like you guys that we've been able to live this dream. Uh, to give you just a, like a teeny bit of our background, um, Sherry and I had this idea to start a, an importing business um, a while ago, and we started doing some research back in 2010. In 2014 was when we first started to go to um, a few small anime shows. And we thought, OK, well, we'll try maybe four or five a year. you know, And hopefully, we'll be able to maybe pay off some student loans a little bit or, or help our dad, because our dad's going blind. And we didn't know what kind of technology he might need. And within the first couple of shows, we had been invited to 50 more. So we thought, maybe we have something here. Just a guess. And, uh, and very quickly, we reached the point where um, we were looking at going coast to coast. We're based out of Chicago, um, but we realized that maybe this is going to become bigger than we expected, quicker than we expected. We always thought there would be a need for kimono out there, because we saw fewer and fewer people walking around anime conventions not wearing kimono. And that's sad, because ultimately, this is about Japanese culture. And if you can't celebrate kimono at a place that is supposed to celebrate Japanese culture, it's sort of like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's, it's sort of like trying to celebrate Italian culture without pasta. It doesn't work. So when we, so we were surprised by our success, but in a way it kind of made sense because it didn't seem like people were able to get kimono in the, into the country very affordably. And that was why it took us four years of research to start this business. We had to figure out not only our contacts in Japan, we had to make contacts, we had to make friends, we had to, to talk to people, we had to eat strange things and drink a lot of alcohol at a lot of business dinners. And when I say a lot of alcohol, guys, <laughs> I mean a lot of alcohol. Um, let's put it this way, certain brands of sake are your friend until they're suddenly not your friend anymore. Um, but at any rate, at any rate, um, we reached the point within nine months that we had wanted to get in five years. So our five-year plan was achieved by nine months. And then we, we were like, okay, let's make another five-year plan. And we achieved that within a year. So now we've had other plans that started out being maybe 15-year plans or 20-year plans, and we're actively working on them right now. As in, they should be achieved within the next six months to a year. So we're moving a lot faster than we expected, and we're a lot more successful than we ever expected to be. And really, it's because of all of you guys. When we talk to people in Japan, they ask us lots of questions like, well, people in America want kimono? What, what do you mean? People in America? Like, why do they want kimono? That, that seems so strange to people. People in Japan don't understand that people outside Japan want kimono. It comes as a surprise to just about everybody we talk to, especially to the degree that you folks want kimono. And if you've seen our booth over the progression of this con, you will see just how much people want kimono. We're starting to look a little picked over here, but we've still got great stuff. I pulled all of this from my stock, so we've still got great stuff. 
but um, it's really because you folks have shown an interest in kimono that we're able to do what we do. So we always want to thank everybody at all of the shows that we go to for being here, for being interested in kimono, and for being willing to try, because this is ultimately foreign clothing. It is unlike anything that we might ever otherwise wear. And so it is really a credit to all of you that you're willing to try, that you're willing to reach, you're willing to extend yourselves and try something that's new, that's different. You're willing to give it a shot. I know a lot of people might be afraid to try because they're afraid of making a mistake. They're afraid of offending people. They're afraid of cultural appropriation. They're afraid of all of these things. But the reality is, in Japan, people support people wearing kimono. They might be surprised that you're interested, but everybody we have talked to, and we have talked to people from all walks of life, how do you feel about foreigners wearing kimono? How do you feel about non-Japanese wearing kimono? It's welcomed. It is welcomed. They do not take this as cultural appropriation. They are not offended. They are not upset. Even if you're wearing it in, in ways that nobody from a hoity-toity kimono dressing school would ever wear it, even if you think, oh, no, I made a mistake. <laughs> no, no, no. You're trying. You're doing this. That is amazing. So I, I just want to put that in perspective for all of you, to give yourselves really a pat on the back for being willing to try, for being willing to reach and extend yourselves. Because sometimes foreign different things can be scary, but don't be scared. I know that kimono looks like a, a really cumbersome process, or you might think, oh, there are so many steps that I have to do, or I don't know if I'm going to get this right. Um, part of what we really focused on when we started our business was how to make wearing kimono as approachable as possible to as many people as possible. And we wanted to make sure that we did that regardless of people's ethnicity, regardless of gender, regardless of size, regardless of age, regardless of marital status, regardless of anything, disability, doesn't matter. We want people to be able to wear kimono. And sometimes we hear negative words. Sometimes people are told, oh, you're, you're too fat to wear this. Or you can't wear that in a wheelchair. Or you're going to ruin the line of the kimono because you know, you're missing an arm. I mean, these are things that I have heard. I have heard people, I have customers who tell me they've been told these things. You're too young for this. You're too old for this. This, this is too different for you. So many people hear no, 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 no. But I'm here to tell you yes. I'm here to tell you yes. This is a process that takes a little bit of practice, but Sherry and I, my sister, she's on her way over from the vendor room. We have worked very, very hard to try to make this as approachable as possible for as many people as possible. And we're still working. One of the things that if you follow our social media, we're starting to release our, our own line of OB. This has been a really exciting thing for us. This is something that we didn't think would come for a long, long time. We started designing our own Tabi. We've got those in production, and now we're working on OB. Pretty soon, it's going to be even more because we want to be able to serve people of all sizes, and that can be hard to do in kimono. It is absolutely possible as it is right now. But we also want to see if we can come out with things that help everybody, you know, regardless of how tall you are, short you are, what your size is, doesn't matter. Okay? So if you get the chance to, I do appreciate it if you could follow us on you know, the Book of Faces or the Instagrams or whatever the cool kids are doing these days. I don't handle any of this myself, but I do appreciate it. I do notice when we get likes and follows and all that fun stuff, it's my sister who manages all of that. But we do appreciate that support very, very much. It's because of shows like this and people like you that we're able to live the dream, go coast to coast, meet so many awesome people, and really bring something that we absolutely love to all of you. It's so great for us to see some of the same people over and over again who are really growing in their collections and their understanding of kimono, people who decide, I'm going to go to Japan now. I didn't think I could do it, but I'm going to go to Japan 
we get really excited about that. And in fact, we have a panel after this one, How to Japan. So if you want to stick around, it's in the same room. Um, and we're going to be talking about some ways to make Japan um, e easier to do. It's a, a very different place. It's a very different country. But it is something you can do. Okay, So stick around after we're done here, and we'll, we'll talk about that. In the meantime, I'm going to explain a few things now. Now that I'm done like thanking everybody here, because thank you again. We love you all. We look forward to coming to Dallas every year. We really do. Even with the heat, we love being here. Um, so now I'm going to explain a few things about kimono, and then we're going to get on to explaining the dressing. Okay. So first of all, there are some differences in types of kimono. Now, one of those differences comes down to gender. Now, given that kimono are a garment that has been around for a few hundred years, and prior to that we had the kosode, that's sort of the forerunner to kimono, um, the kimono evolved to the point where there was a gender distinction. Older kimono, types of kimono called kosode, Sometimes we can't always tell the gender of the person who would have worn that kosode because they're so ornate, they're so elaborate, they're so amazing. Um, but men and women wore beautiful kosode, and you had kabuki actors who were playing female parts, who were wearing glorious pieces, and you had kabuki actors wearing male pieces that were glorious. So. Sometimes we can't even tell the gender. Gender differences sort of evolved over time. And now we're starting to see a little bit of a de-evolution. It used to be, um, as of about 100, 120 years ago, that men's kimono were stitched closed at the sleeve. And we'll see an example of this in a few minutes. And women's kimono were open at the sleeve. And the idea behind this is that over time, women's obi became wider and wider and wider. And the sleeve of the kosode, again, the forerunner of kimono, had to be opened up closer and closer to the underarm in order to be able to accommodate that wider obi. Men's obi stayed much more narrow. Okay? So you didn't need to separate that sleeve from the body nearly as much, if at all. So that's really structurally the main difference between men's and women's kimono. But children's kimono are all open at the underarm. So there's no distinction in structure between boys and girls. Um, the idea is that all children run hot. They're, they have high body temperatures. So they need to have that ventilation. I don't know about you guys, but I have kids and I totally buy that. I think that's, that's probably accurate. My kids have ADHD, of course, so they're burning off energy like crazy. But I think any kid is going to be a little warm. So um, when I say that today the gender distinctions are, are sort of de-evolving, we're starting to see more and more people playing with gender. They're playing with gender distinctions. We're seeing in some of the fashion magazines women wearing pieces that would otherwise be for men and vice versa. We have walked around the streets of Japan and we have seen men wearing kimono jackets that have open sleeves as opposed to closed. Um, also, when we get kimono, we import over 10,000 pieces per year, kimono, obi, kimono jackets, etc. And we have seen all kinds of interesting alterations to kimono, ways of either closing the sleeve or opening the sleeve to sort of switch. So that's why, in, especially here in the States, we're moving beyond the idea that there's just these rigid gender roles. We're starting to see that also in Japan as well, but especially in the States, you know, we've evolved. And so that's why we tell people, you do you. We're not going to tell you what you can and can't wear. We're not going to tell you, oh, well, you look male, so you need to wear this. Or you look female, so you need to wear flowers. And that's it. It's not like that. Um, what we tell everybody is you pick what represents you the best because the idea is that kimono are a representation of what, what makes you tick, what makes you happy, things that you like, something that speaks to you. The kimono should be sort of a reflection of your personality. So don't let the idea of gender dissuade you. 
And um, especially for us, for our business, I can't speak for anybody else who sells kimono. There's a few others out there who do. I can't speak for them, but in my case, I'm not going to tell somebody you can't wear this. No. Because I want you to wear the thing that best represents you. Um, similarly, age and marital status. Sometimes I'll have people who say, oh, well, you know, if you're older, you can only wear sort of darker colors. Not necessarily the case. I mean, I've encountered grandmothers with dyed purple hair walking around in Hurisode at um, Fushimi Inari in Japan. <laughs> That's a, a major shrine near Kyoto. I've seen it. You know, you can wear brighter colors if you're older. I'm married. I wear hurisore. Hurisore is a long flowing sleeve kimono typically for young unmarried women. Doesn't matter. This makes me happy. I'm going to wear it. Um, especially for those who are not Japanese. If you wear your kimono in Japan regardless of what type it is, people are going to support you. So especially because you are starting to see a lot of people playing with a lot of the rules, rules of how to wear kimono. Kimono are evolving. Kimono have always evolved, but they're still evolving. So um, that's why, you know, like I said, for our business, if I'm saying that something is men's or women's, that means that sort of traditionally, that's how it's seen. But that doesn't mean that that's how you have to do it, okay? And same thing for married, unmarried, or young, or older, it doesn't matter. Um, also, some people have the idea that if you're in, uh, if you have a disability, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't wear kimono. Not so. There are plenty of ways to wear kimono, and I'm going to also demonstrate for everybody, because this is important for everybody to know, not just people who are um, using a wheelchair, how to sit in kimono and not have it fly open <laughs> on you. So we'll go over that as soon as we get some people dressed. Um, aside from that. The, aside from the gender distinction, there are a few other distinctions. There's um, some distinctions that are determined by type of fabric. So for example, I am wearing a yukata. A yukata is a light summer cotton kimono that is typically worn to summer festivals. They're typically a little bit more brightly patterned. Um, this one has Hello Kitty on it. So this is a very somber piece, really. I mean, this is a very serious piece, right? Um, and so these are, um, yukata started out as bathrobes that you would wear to and from the onsen, uh, but over time they sort of evolved into something that you would wear at festivals. Festivals are party time. You're letting your hair down. Um, especially in the evenings, you're letting your hair down. Um, the, the festivals are very crowded. Um, weather in Japan can be very hot and humid. And so you don't want to wear something very heavy. You want to wear something that breathes, um, something that can be washed a little bit easier, and something fun. You're out to have fun. So yukata are ideal for that kind of thing. Um, kimono, on the other hand, yes? Sir? To and from the onsen. Oh, onsen, sorry. If, and if I say anything that you guys don't understand, if I throw in a term that you're not familiar with, please do let me know. That's good. Um, the onsen is the bath. So in an onsen, um, you, you wash off first, and then you sit in typically warm, hot, often very hot, water, um, preferably from like a mineral bath or a mineral source. Um, and, and it's it's... A pretty amazing experience. Um, but coming out of the onsen, you know, you're hot. Your, your body temperature is elevated. That water is typically very hot. So you don't want to wear something that's going to be clinging to you. You don't necessarily want to wear silk. You don't want to wear a wool. You know, you don't want to wear anything that's going to be very hot for you. So light cotton is a good plan. And yeah, over time, people are like, well, it's humid out here. It's uh, it's really kind of gross weather. So we're going to wear yukata. So that's one distinction. Another distinction is um, a type of formality. So sometimes people might ask, well, how do I know what type of kimono this is? Where can I wear this kind of kimono? A general rule of thumb is that if you have a pattern that is all over the kimono, it is either semi-formal or informal. Um, and this, the semi-formality is kind of a... There's some differences in there that are not really important right now. But generally speaking, if you have the pattern all over the place um, in a repeated way, then that is less formal. If you have the pattern only in strategic locations, typically in the front left panel, and we're going to see an example of this, 
or a, pa or a pattern in the shoulders or the back of one of the shoulders um, and on one side of the sleeve and then the back of the other sleeve that asymmetry helps to tell you that this is a more formal piece. So my yukata, for example, has Hello Kitty just literally all over it. Do we think that this is formal or informal? Yeah. Informal, right. Um, to give you another example, this kimono here has this repeated bamboo pattern all over it. Formal or informal? Informal. informal. Mm -hmm. Semi-formal, um, in this case, would typically be, this is not silk. Um, Semi-formal is typically going to be silk, uh, might not be. And semi-formal, oftentimes, will have a mark on the back of the neck called a moan or a crest. Okay, it's a family crest. So a lot of times, semi-formal ones will have one or maybe three of those across maybe the, um, uh, the back of the sleeves or on the front. Um, the most formal kind of places, uh, pieces have five moan, or in the case of the hudisode, which is the long flowing sleeves, we're going to see one of those a little bit later, um, that one's formal and you can tell basically by the length of the sleeves. Also the pattern is not all over. So yes, this one is an informal kimono, this one is called a komon. Komon is spelled K-O-M-O-N when you romanize it. Common kind of sounds like the word common. So it kind of means like this is for kind of common everyday time. So I'm going to the grocery store, I'm going out to do some errands, I'm maybe going to, uh, you know, maybe I might drop by the temple just to, you know, just briefly, and uh, I'm just going about my day. So I'm going to wear a common. Um, other types of kimono um, that have different patterns all over the place, um, you know, asymmetrical patterns. There's things like homongi, which are traveling kimono. They're for visiting people. So it's a more formal kind of situation. You're paying a visit. Um, there's also kurotome sode. Kurotome sode are sort of the married woman's equivalent of the hoodie sode. Those are typically black. They have five crests. They're very formal, typically worn by like mother of the bride. Um, and then there's uh, kimono like the furisore. So this is a common. This one here is a very subtle pattern throughout. This may look blue from a distance, but there's a very subtle sort of weave pattern to it. So formal or informal? Informal, yeah, because the pattern is all over the place, right? It does not have any kind of asymmetrical placement. This one has a pattern of chrysanthemums everywhere. It's the same pattern repeated, so that makes it informal. Mm -hmm. But this is kind of a nicer fabric, like a, a silkier fabric than this one. So maybe this one is for like uh, going out to eat or going to some place maybe a little nicer, you know? This one, whoop, there we go. We have our long flowing sleeves. with this one. Would anyone like to be my model for this? I saw a hand. All right, come on up. Now, there's another type of piece that we're going to talk about before I get to this one. And that is called the Nagajuban. 
Now, a lot of times this is just abbreviated as Juban. So Naga Juban, N-A-G-A, J-U-B-A-N is how it's romanized. Um, or it can be just abbreviated as J-U-B-A-N. This is the rough equivalent of a kimono undershirt. So if you wear like a button-down um, shirt or blouse and you have, let's say, um, a t-shirt or a cami or a tank top underneath, this is the kimono equivalent. The idea is that this kind of piece helps to make it possible for you to not have to wash the kimono nearly as much. Because to wash kimono in the olden days, you had to take the kimono completely apart and wash the panels lay them out on wooden boards that were sort of angled so that all the pieces would dry straight and evenly and if there was any shrinkage it would be even and then um, the then the kimono would be stitched back together again so that's a lot of work you don't want to have to do that very often you would much rather just get a new one of this or wash this this is easier to put together hmm? These can be made out of anything. Um, the, the really, really formal ones are typically made out of silk. Um, this one is maybe a silk synthetic. Yeah, this one might have some rayon to it. Um, rayon is actually a fairly popular fabric for kimono. It was invented um, around the turn of the century, a little bit before then. Um, it's wood pulp fiber, fiber. So rayon is very nice. It's a nice alternative to silk. So it can be very difficult to care for if you do it the wrong way. Um, rayon was seen as an easier alternative. Juban these days, this is a pretty modern juban. It actually has a tag on the inside, which is kind of rare for vintage kimono. Um, but this one, um, being modern, I would say you know modern pieces can be polyester, they can be rayon, they can be cotton, they can be wool, um, they can be padded if they are for. Um, for cold climates or cold times. Um, if you're further to the north and you're experiencing a lot of cold weather, you might have a, a heavier weight juban. You might have a juban that has lining to it. It could even be quilted um, to add extra warmth. But for this, I picked a, a, what's called a hitoe, which is a single layer. Um, kind of juban because I, I didn't want anybody to be roasting so just just trying to think of the climate here guys <laughs> all right that, that's good okay and so So the question was, if it, if it doesn't have a pattern, is it considered kimono? Yes, it is. Um, the kimono that don't have a pattern, it, it does happen. Um, more often, you will have some kind of pattern, even it's, if it's a very, very subtle one. Um, it might be actually woven into the fabric, or it might be part of the ground, essentially, of the fabric. The ground is, is basically the background, OK? And um, so typically, that is what's done. Now, if it's plain color, usually it's going to have a very nice weave to it. It might have a textured weave to it. It might be um, like a cheating and crepe or um, a kinsha. It might, it might have like a nice texture to it. Um, because even in plain things, you want to have some elegance to it. You want to demonstrate that this is, this is something beautiful to wear. So for the, um, the pieces that you need to wear a kimono, one of the things that you need is called a koshihimo. Now this is, this is one straight from Japan. Many times they are tapered at the ends and have a little bit of thread at the end. Um, that said, we've also gotten in koshihimo that are not like this. This is a modern one. This one's brand new. 
Um, we've gotten in antique ones that are basically just strips of old kimono that were stitched together to form a, a tie, basically a sash. So you don't necessarily have to have this to do that. And in fact, we actually tend to use a wider sash like this um, to include with our kimono. These are available if, if people want to purchase them, but we find that the sash can be a little bit longer and sometimes it's more comfortable for people who are not used to wearing kimono because it just sort of distributes um, the, the tension a little bit more along the body. This can be a little bit narrow. Um, so because sometimes people are not always as comfortable with these, that's why we do the sashes. But really, nobody's going to see this. So if you want to use twill tape or shoelace, I mean, you can, you can do that. I would just say wear what's comfortable. So. Oh, and then typically, another thing, I'm sorry, let me just stand up for no reason, but you know what, stay there because I'm going to grab you in a second. Um, another thing that is typically done with a juban, that is not done with this one, is typically you will stitch on a collar. That's what this is called. Yeah, I'm going to drop it. But this collar is typically folded over the collar of the juban. And the reason why this is done is because the collar comes into contact with your skin. And so you can end up getting like a sweat stain, basically, if you're not careful. So this, you can always just remove it and replace it with another one. These are meant to be not exactly disposable, but a little bit. Okay. We typically, unless the, the um, collar is in really fantastic shape, like clearly it hasn't been used before, we tend to remove these from Jubon. Um, and so, yeah, basically, this one does not have that extra collar. So I'm going to put this down real quick. And by the way, everybody, I know that um, we're like concentrated up in the front here. If anybody wants to relocate or come around to the sides or get a better look, or you know, now that we've got everybody who's you know looked at the books, if you guys want to um, scoot up to the front row, that's totally fine. If you want to take pictures or video, that's all good. Um, I'm totally happy with that. So anytime you want to stand up or move around or get a better look, totally fine with me. Just try to make sure you're not like obstructing the. the the people behind you, um, but otherwise, yeah, feel free to, to take a closer look at anything, okay? So the main thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take my Traditionally, you would twist it a couple of times and tuck the ends into either side. However, because everybody here, I'm assuming, is relatively new to kimono, I would say probably tie it until you become more comfortable with the twist and tuck method. In Japan, if you were getting dressed by a professional, they would be twisting it and then tucking the ends in. But um, again, because we are typically working with people who have never experienced kimono before, um, we tended to adapt the methods to make sure that this is approachable to everybody. So this is just basically done in a square knot. Um, I can do this in a bow. I could do this in a slip knot. I can do it in whatever whatever makes sense. Okay. So. Oh, that's good. I'm glad it's comfortable. <laughs> now, I'm going to have you turn this way. I have also made sure to add a little bit of drape to the nape of the neck. Okay, so basically a gap. So the idea is, especially for, for women's pieces, and I'm going to tug down right here to make that a little bit more visible. The idea is that the sexiest part of the body is the nape of the neck. So you're, you're very sexy right here. <laughs> Right, right? This is like, you know, you got your ankles going here. Now, this drape of the nape of the neck can be difficult to maintain. If you are new to kimono, I would say 
don't worry about it. If this is if this is getting too hard for you to do, then don't worry about it. Oftentimes at conventions, I do not have a drape because I'm wearing my shoulder bag, and I'm also moving around quite a bit um, and very quickly um, because, as you guys probably saw, our booth gets pretty slammed. So I don't worry about the drape because I I can't essentially. So if this drape is hard for you to achieve, don't worry about it for now. As you get more accustomed to wearing kimono, you'll start to find that the if you want to, if you want the drape, it is definitely achievable. Now for men's pieces, traditionally you would not have a drape to the nape of the neck. The kimono would be resting closer to the back of the neck. Okay. So uh, there is a tool that can help you achieve more of a drape, and that tool is a collar stiffener. Um, called an eighty sheen. Sheen means stiffener. So this eighty sheen, once you sew on that extra white collar, this is slid between the two layers of the collar and the juban, and this provides a little bit of extra stiffening to it. It's again optional, and if you are, you know, if you're feeling like, hey, I'm just doing good to get this thing on and closed and able to be walked around in, then don't worry about this. Okay? All right, so from here, another kimono difference is that this one is unlined. That's called hitoe. Hitoe means layer, so it's one layer. Okay, awase is layered. So if you have um, a lining, then that's called an awase kimono. Um, hitoe are generally worn in warmer times, and awase are typically worn in colder times. Now in Japan, there are all kinds of you know guidelines as to when you should switch from hitoe to awase and back and forth. However, the international kimono wearing community generally agrees that you need to modify things to your own climate. If you're going to die of heat stroke, you might leave a really good looking corpse in your kimono, but nobody wants you to die. <laughs> so please don't get heat stroke. Don't freeze to death either. At least, I know you guys get some kind of cold weather, right? <laughs> 40? Oh, 40? Oh, psh. Guys. I'm from Kansas City, so I'm used to having four climates in one day. Oh, yeah, well, in Chicago, too. Four climates in a day? Yeah, we do that. Okay, so if, if in this kind of you know environment, if you are too cold wearing Hitoe, then yes, yeah, switch to Oase. Um, but for this show, considering it's in the summer, we tried to bring a lot of Hitoe. They don't generally fall during the transformation sequences. I mean, I don't know, you know, if they float, yeah. Now, one of the things that we'll also notice is that this is long, right? So one of the things that people will often say when they come to our booth is, oh man, I must be too short to wear kimono. And I kind of look at people and say, okay, you know these come from Japan, right? <laughs> Think about that. I'm not going to say that everybody in Japan is short. I mean, people are getting taller and taller as time goes on. But the national average height is shorter than in the United States, just generally speaking. Yeah, for women, it's 5'2". And uh, in the States, believe it or not, it's about 5'4", 5'5". 
but um, it, it's still, you know, a difference. So while it definitely can be said you can definitely find taller people in Japan, um, overall, they might have a harder time finding kimono that work for them, and that's also true in the States. Um, but this length is, is, for a woman's kimono, it's pretty typical to have the kimono very long. And that's okay, because we are going to tuck it up. So the way we're going to do that, and I'm going to like shrink down here so that you guys can kind of see what I'm doing here. And this is usually the part where people like kind of scoot around or stand up or come to the sides to see what's going on. So again, feel free to move around because it's going to make this a lot easier and I want you to actually learn as opposed to like being polite. <laughs> Don't be polite. You need to learn. <laughs> All right, and just mind the people who are behind you. Yes, you are very traditional here. Just mind the people who are behind you to ensure that they can also see, okay? So I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. You're going to try to size this so that your left-hand side can go over a little bit further. Now it depends on how the kimono fits you. But in this case, we've got this front panel going towards the front, okay? So because this fabric has some grip to it, I'm already gonna kind of work it. Another trick that you can also do, I'll shimmy this up a little higher, is to bring the bottom corner of the kimono up slightly, sweep it up a little bit. So the idea is that this corner and the other corner have a couple centimeters distance between them. I actually want to do that better. The idea of having this, this corner point up a little bit is that as you walk, this is all straight panels. It's gonna make it a lot easier for this to stay closed as you walk, okay? So if you can get this all the way over, great. If you can't, don't worry about it. Most of my kimono, I don't get them over this far. This is, um, in this case, we shifted this a little bit, but yeah, we made this work. So, I'm going to take the koshihimo and I'm going to use it to tie around here. Now again, traditionally you would twist and tuck. But because we are learning, we are going to tie. Okay. All right, so now we just have this little knot in here. We're going to have the koshihimo. We're good. Okay? So now the bottom. I know I can pick this up here. So now the bottom is set. We like the bottom. The bottom is good. Okay, and a lot of times people get kind of like, oh no, the top is all messed up. Don't worry about it. This is an art form. We'll fix it. It's okay. Everybody here is an artist, right, in some way. It starts out messy, and then you revise it. You fix it. If you're an author, you start out with a rough draft, and then you revise it, and it gets better. Okay. No, no, we can't just throw it in the trash. No, no, no. Okay, so what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to start blousing down over this tie. Okay, I'm going to have you turn just like you sort of are here. Excellent. I'm also going to make sure I didn't tie my sleeves into my kimono. But the idea is, keep going for me, and pause right there. I want this to be neat. I don't want to tug so much that I'm going to affect this up front here, but I do want a smooth tuck. Now, one thing you may notice is that we do have some bunching around where the koshihimo is, okay? Theoretically, you are supposed to, if you have a curvy figure, you want to make sure that you have some padding towards the sides or towards the front or even in the back to make yourself a little bit more of a cylinder for women's pieces. Um, but 
I, I mean, my OB is kind of crunching in on the sides here. Granted, it's because I've been working all day, but it's also because padding involves more layers. So you're, you can take a towel and basically pad the sides or the back or even the front of your body. That gets warm. I'm working. It's Dallas. I'm from Chicago. Kind of terrified by your heat. I don't care if it's dry heat. It's heat. I'm not wearing towels around myself if I don't have to. I love you all, but I'm not padding for you. So, now what you might wonder uh, too about for men's fit, interestingly, the way that men's kimono have traditionally been fit really shows how warped our concept of beauty is as a society. The idea is that you need to have some belly in order to make sure that the kimono fits properly. Because if you have a belly, that means that you can afford to eat. And eating is beautiful. We love eating. We love eating. Eating is good. So when I've been to kimono wearing um, demonstrations where there's a teacher from Japan who's come, I have seen teachers take, the, they always take just the skinniest beanpole teenage boy and they start putting padding on him. And by the time they're done, this 95 pound teen, like 13 year old boy looks like he's like 175 pounds. <laughs> it's like he put on all, he, he, just, he just hit the freshman 15 and kept going. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but that's but that's what that's what you want for the kimono to look right okay do you have to pad no you don't have to pad but just to tell you that's kind of tradition so okay from here I'm gonna put this down real quick So you may notice that I folded this kimono collar in. If the, co if the collar is very, very wide, the idea is that you fold it in. This is kind of a pain in the butt. So what some people do is they will run a stitch through here. They'll basically take the tip of this collar and um, basically tack it or just uh, do like a little whip stitch to secure that down. I should do that with all my kimono, but in a surprise twist of fate, I always run out of time. <laughs> so I just end up with, a, with my collar not stitched. Um, we get in so many pieces, we see so many examples of how to stitch kimono. People might ask, how do I do this? Any way you feel like. That's how it works. Any way that's going to make it stay put. Some people will also just press this down. A little bit to make it stay nicely it's totally up to you now one technique that I use if I have somebody who is a little bit more busty sometimes I will just leave this collar open I'll keep it folded in the back but I will leave the collar more open to get more coverage basically thank you for, for providing more chest <laughs> This is my lovely assistant here. So, yes. <laughs> and now sometimes I'll also have guys that are like, well, this is really open on me. Like, is this, is this right? Is this proper? Well, I mean, ideally, you'd like to have things close, closer towards your throat if you're going to be proper, very, you know, buttoned down and, and tucked in kind of style. That said, again, the rules are kind of changing. They're devolving. And, and that's why I brought some of the books that I did so that you can see, like, the, the Modi girl over there and the um, Kimono Times collection there shows some really interesting ways to wear kimono. So I would say make your choices consciously. You know, if you want to be a little bit more of a badass, then go for it. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know wear your kimono a little bit more open. Um, you you can show some chest here. Show that you know you're awesome. You're you're a badass guy, and there you go. So in all the modernity of kimonos, have they implemented pockets? No. No, of course not. No, 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 no pockets, no pockets. You're, that's silly. Okay, so there's, um, you can optionally do this to make it easier to wear the kimono. You don't have to. You can stash it down again. Okay, so you can stash it down again. Yeah. 
So if you want something, if you want to make sure that something is laying the way that you want it to for kimono, your options are to tie it down, to stitch it down, or to tuck it down. Those are your options. We don't really do zippers or buttons or, or things like that. Just more cloth. Just, just more fabric. That's what you do. Okay. All right. So now that we have done this, we have our obi. Now obi, there are different types of obi as well as there are different types of kimono. This type of obi, <laughs> it does kind of like a little table runner. Actually, it's very common to see obi that are um, partially deconstructed and used as table runners. And in fact, if you go to Japan and you go to the airport, you'll sometimes see like obi table runners there. Don't buy them, they're really overpriced. Um, but they're really beautiful. Okay, so from here, this type of obi, by the way, is called a Nagoya obi. Can anybody guess where this comes from, this idea? Maybe Nagoya! Yeah, so the idea was kimono, uh, or obi always used to be this wide, and then people decided, well, we fold it in half to wrap it around ourselves anyway, so why don't we just start with it folded? Kind of makes life easier. It was a bunch of geisha and Nagoya who decided, maybe, this, maybe let's do this. And so pretty soon, lots and lots of obi became Nagoya obi. So I'm going to show you what's called a traditional otaiko. You may notice that this is not what we do at our booth, and there's a reason for that. So I'm going to show you how that works. From here, we need a couple of accessories. We need an obiage. Obiage is a sash, typically silk. It was always silk. Many times it has a bumpy texture in at least part of it. That's called shibori. Shibori is amazing. This is all hand tied and then dip dyed. So all these little bumps were tied and then dip dyed. And then another accessory that you need is called an obi makura. Makura means pillow. So this just means obi pillow. It's pretty descriptive. <laughs> now you can't have obi dai makura. Dai just means big. So dai makura just means big pillow. That's all it is. So you know, it's pretty simple. So this typically, modern ones have ties on them, which just makes it easier. Older ones don't have ties because life is hard. I'm going to put this 
above this twist. I'm going to pass the ends forward. You can hold those. Okay. Tie those in a knot. If you're doing this on yourself, oftentimes you wrap the pillow with the opiate together and do all of this together. I am going to do it that way if you can. This cord is called an obigine. It's kumihimo braided. Kumihimo just means that it's a type of braiding. Um, sometimes the threads are dip dyed, so this one is here. Kumihimo braiding can be done in circles. It could be done in sort of a flat tie like this one. There's different formalities. Don't worry about that for now. You, you don't need to worry about it. But basically, this is going to help support the bottom of the pillow. Thank you. 
So that's the Otaiko. There's a reason why we don't do that at the booth very much unless people request it. If you request it, then we, we will do it for you. But it requires extra pieces, and we don't want people to have to spend extra money unless they really, really want to. So if you really want to, you can do it. We're not going to tell you no, but we don't want to make it necessary for you because, again, we want this to be as approachable as possible. Okay, so we're going to do the next one. Next one's going to go a lot faster. You may notice that this is shorter. Men's pieces were typically not tucked up. So the women's have the ohashori. Ohashori means a fold at the waist. Men's pieces typically didn't. You can use an ohashori, I mean, <laughs> you can use a koshihimo, which is this thing, if you want, but you don't have to. Now for both of these, I put the right side down and then the left hand side down, as opposed to the other way. Some people remember this as leftover rice, because the left panel goes over the right panel. The reason why is because if you do it the other way, you're, you're the dead one at the funeral. So, now I have had people intentionally be dead, you know, bleach cosplayers, Persephone, people like that. And I, I had a customer who was in mortuary. She very nearly did hers dead. But, anyway, um, if you're alive, you put your right hand side down first and then your left hand side. Now the bow tie is actually pretty unisex. People might think, oh, those are girly. Not necessarily. Uh, a very standard tie for men's kimono and men's obi, which this one is, is the bow tie. And in fact, if we were wearing hakama, which I don't have at this show, I'm sorry, but those are the, the pants, basically. You do wear a bow tie because that's what you use to wrap the ties of the pants around to kind of secure them. Start with step over the shoulder. Hang on to that for me. And then I'm going to have you turn. <laughs> and keep going. And pause. And back, back up a little bit. Up. I've given it a little bit of a tug in this corner. Whoa, except I'm undoing my work here. I've given this a little bit of a tug to basically make this a little bit straighter. This is going to stay in my left hand until I'm done making the bow. This comes down underneath. The short end goes under the long end to make a knot. This becomes skinnier. It was already kind of skinny. We're going to make it skinnier. I'm going to give it to you. This, I can either flip it to the plain side or I can keep it patterned. I'm going to start rolling it. I'm going to decide how wide I want my bow to be. 
A lot of times for guys, it's about this wide. I'm just going to crunch it in a little bit. Here's the knot. Here's the bow. Here's the rest of the obi. Don't touch this part. I'm going to take this. The bottom, the rest of the obi. So there's the first layer of the obi. No touchies. No touchies the first layer. Yes. I can fit my hand around both the knot and the bow. Okay? I should be able to say hi. I'm going to wrap this skinny bit around both the knot and the bow. And if you're missing this right now, I'm going to do it again in just a minute, so don't worry. I'm going to do it again. Whee! If I have a lot of obi, I can do it even more. Otherwise, I'm going to tuck the rest. Now you touch this layer. I'm going to tuck the rest between the body and the obi, and then I'm going to make sure that my bow looks good. Okay? All right. And if you want to turn around, da da da. Okay, and then you can have a seat. Oh yes, don't forget that. Okay. Oh, I forgot one more thing. I'm not going to make you wear this because I, I really don't want you to roast. But you can wear a jacket. You can wear a jacket over a kimono. Are you cold? Oh, you can wear this. Okay. Now I want to show one interesting feature. Some men's jackets. No. If you want to know the reason why, come to my history of kimono panel on Monday. Okay. Volunteer, I saw your hand. Now, lots of times people will say, well, I don't know if I can wear this kimono, and what if I'm too big for it, or what if I'm wearing a Lolita outfit, or a corset, or a skirt, or nine tails, or a fursuit, or whatever else you crazy kids come up with. There are other ways to wear a kimono. Some of them are demonstrated in a couple of the books down that way. I'm going to show you what we call Harajuku style. The idea is that we came upon this idea in Harajuku from some girls who were wearing this kimono hiked up short. And the reason why was because they wanted to wear their grandmother's kimono, but their grandmothers were about this big. And they were not this big. They were bigger. They still wanted to wear them, so they wore them in what they call modern style or new style, or they were thinking of it. We asked them, like, why, what do you call this style? Mm, Harajuku style. We said, okay, we'll go with that. So we're going to do Harajuku style. Maybe stick 
process. I'm going to tie this off. You can look over here. Tie this off. Blouse over. Get that closed. Or open. If you want to, if you have a lovely blouse, if you have a shirt you want to show up, if you wear a button down shirt, whatever you want to do, you can wear this open. Here. Just like this. Thank you. You're welcome. My lovely assistant here is going to show how to do this stuff. So she's got a full length kimono, but it's hiked up. We've got the kill going on in here. We've got pockets. Pockets. Oh, yeah. Pockets. Oh, yeah. I've never tied my hair into my OB before, ever. Shh. <laughs> Same idea. This long part is in my left hand. I want to be next. Oh, I didn't call for that yet. Okay. Okay. Here we go. I actually did see your hand after I called. But yes, question. Oh, no, in front. And then you. You don't sit against the knot. You sit forward. And if you, but there are flatter knots that you can use. And like for folks in wheelchairs, I'll show them a different knot that they can use. Um, there's also the, um, what we call the California sushi roll, which is also a flatter knot, which I'm going to show you next. It's a modified otaiko. It's easier. I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Okay. This one snaps in. Taking the tag out. No pinchies. Thank you. 
Some obiage don't have shibori. This one's a crepe obiage. This one's a little older. So this type of obi is called a hukuro obi. Sometimes it's called hukuro nagoya because part of this is blank. And that is done to help reduce the weight and also the cost of the obi. Um, a lot of modern obi that are hukuro are hukuro nagoya. You can still get full hukuro. They are considered a little bit form more formal than this. For formaler? They're, more, they're formaler than this. But they're also not as common, and it's not really necessary because this is the part that goes to the body. So if you have an obi that has a blank section, that's the part that gets wrapped around your body. Okay. So to fake an otaiko, we're going to do the California sushi roll. This tutorial is also on our web page. It's a much easier way of doing an otaiko. It's kind of loosely based on a type of knot, sort of like a hikinuki knot, but that's, that's like a term that's 120 years old, so don't worry about it. But um, yeah, basically we picked this up out in uh, little Tokyo in California. It was a Japanese grandmother who said, oh, otaiko, it's so difficult. Just do the sushi roll. <laughs> it's California. Do the sushi roll. So we do the sushi roll. So we wrapped around a few times. I'm going to bunch this into a bit of a triangle. I'm going to take this end, I'm going to grab all the layers. I'm going to grab it with my fingers. This is still kind of long, so I'm going to wrap it around one more time. This is another reason why we call this the sushi roll, is because the toilet paper roll doesn't sound as nice. But if you can wrap toilet paper around the toilet paper roll, then you can do this. A 
Okay, now from here, if you don't want to buy any extra pieces, you don't have to. You can take this bottom portion. Size your knots. I'm going to do this about here. Nine heads. Okay. I'm going to tuck it up underneath the layers as straight as I can. like an otaiko. It's a little bit lower than the otaiko traditionally is. That's okay. We can adjust that if we want to. But generally speaking, this is a way to do an otaiko-like knot without having to buy all kinds of extra pieces. Now, if we want to add the extra pieces, we can do that, and we can do that with the sushi roll. Modified Otaiko, California Sushi Roll. Easier to do. You don't need these pieces. You can get them if you want. But again, the idea is to make this approachable. So another thing that you can also do is you can do the same bow knot with this, and it looks lovely. All right? So, furisore, so if you hold the arms up. Again, formal, long sleeves. There's hand embroidery. There's dyeing. There's painting in here. It's, it's a gorgeous piece. And so, here we are. All right, so we are almost out of time. Uh, we're going to get set up for the How to Japan panel in just a minute. I'm going to grab a picture with the um, models here, but let's have another round of applause for our models. All right, let's all stand up, guys. 
I'm going to grab a picture real quick. But thank you guys all for being here. If you have questions, we'll be able to answer them at the booth. So please come by. And uh, thank you again for being here.